quick move, Madeline. I've got some people I'd like to join you on stage now. Stay right where you are. Uh, I'd like to welcome back Barbara Gessler. And also joining us, we have Sabina Fahayan, who is a member of the European Parliament since 2009. And we also have Johannes Eberg, the Secretary General of the Goethe Institute. Are you all there? Can I see you all? I definitely see Barbara. I don't Hi. know. Do Barbara you see Barbara. us? I do see you. <laughs> so you hear me too. That's good. <laughs> well. Do we have Sabina Fahayan with us on the line? Not yet. Okay, we'll give Sabina Fahayan a couple of minutes to join us and hope that she's not got too many technical difficulties. We nearly got through so the whole evening. Everything Everything is open now. Fantastic. You must hear me and you must see me. We do hear you. We do see you. Well, thank you. I thought we had our first technical glitch of the evening, but I'll knock on wood no. and say nothing. <laughs> so um, brilliant. Sabina, I'm going to start with you. We're having a panel discussion now, and I'm sure you were just as inspired by Madeleine Ritter's um, wonderful keynote as I was. Um, Madeleine's idea of this wings of innovation about giving people freedom for, for breakthrough innovation creativity without the pressure of productivity. I think that's quite a radical idea. And I know that you, Sabina Fahayan, heavily adv advocate the idea that innovation is in fact born in the creative sector. And I know that Barbara Gessler also talked this morning uh, in her, this morning, this evening, um, about the economic side of culture, you know, 7 million jobs, a huge part of the GDP. What do you say, Sabina Fahayan, to this quite radical idea of um, Ms. Ritter's about- I think that, that's- nothing? That's the specificity of culture and the cultural and creative industries or the culture and creative sector, uh, that it's not just economy, that it's not just uh, the one side of the middle, it, you have two sides. You have the, uh, the, the societal meaning, you have the meaning for us as human beings. We are cultural beings as such. And uh, the creativity is mainly coming out of us and not always just productive, that's clear. Um, but uh, uh, the problem for us uh, in, in, on the European level uh, is if we want to get uh, uh, access to the funds, we must also show that this has that this has a value, not perhaps a productive value in a product coming out in the end, but it has a value for our society, for our uh, and also for our economy, because these ideas that are born out of a free cultural uh, uh, meaning uh, that lead to perhaps in future to, to other developments in other sectors. And uh, that's the reason why I'm always happy when we have these uh, combinations uh, of, of artists coming together with engineers, coming together with, uh, 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 with, with, with researchers and just making their thing. And, and, and when you see the outcome, we had one project uh, here in our region where a theater and uh, not just performing arts, but also um, uh, 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 painters uh, work together with engineers from universities and, and researchers. And uh, there were wonderful outcomes. Totally different sector to to come over the the, the small uh, borders, the small uh, uh, room you are living in normally in your everyday life. Absolutely, I think that's one of the definitions of creativity is connecting the dots from very different areas and, and positions. And I think that's a really lovely point, Madeline. What do you say to that about this um, creativity being born from from the co coming together of different perspectives? Diversity is a huge topic here, right? Well, definitely, and. Um... I mean, this is, I mean, when, when I, I remember 30 years ago with my first European application, this idea that there would be money for traveling around Europe, meeting people and putting our heads together, this was amazing. And this is still very much at the core um, of this whole idea behind it. And of course, uh, we have to see how, 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 how we can do, because we also know virtually, uh, the image was set before, there is a limitation and, um, 
uh, also convincing on a political level. I know Sabine Verheyen, you, you have an amazing, you put out a joint motion for resolution for cultural recovery. Uh, I was reading it uh, before and it was amazing. You, you put everything in there and said, yes, if, if we can reach that, that's amazing. <laughs> really together. If we, if we can reach that. <laughs> yes. You touched a bit there. Oh, sorry, Sabina, please continue. Yeah, it's, it, uh, uh, I think it's, it's very important to show that uh, many politicians uh, also in the European Parliament understood how important the sector is, especially coming out of the crisis, we saw how important uh, culture and, and uh, the cultural and creative sectors are for our life. Um, but we have to show that also to our member states so that we get uh, the adequate funding for the recovery uh, of the sector because the sector was hit most and hit very hard by the COVID-19 uh, lockdowns. I mean, I, I had to think of, of some things, uh, some, some, uh, some, uh, some ideas about your, your intervention. I mean, the first thing I was uh, the idea of giving interrail tickets to everybody, which came out some years ago. And I have three children, two of my, uh, my, my two older boys, they did interrail this year. And, and I think it was wonderful for them to experience Europe in this way. Mm -hmm. uh, the second thought is that this kind of innovation, I don't know if you can do it through a really huge program. I think it's more a decentralized task of institutions like the Universität von Hamburg to organize this kind of thing. This is something we, we, we really think about very much in our institution. How can we create this kind of uh, innovation? And the third thought was, we are some years ago, I met Mrs. Mogherini and we were talking about the Erasmus program for artists. And now we are doing with uh, Creative Europe, we are doing one pilot program, iPortunus, which gives artists the possibility to travel freely within Europe to meet other artists and develop projects. It's not, it's not uh, as you proposed, totally free of an aim because you have to you have to have a certain project you have to have a certain id but this is the idea that you just said now you can travel uh, and meet other artists and other institutions and and the outcome of this project was very successful so we are doing the second round now but under covid of course it will be it will be not so easy but i think this physical meeting of people to develop ideas over european across european borders it will stay very, very important for us, even in times of, of the pandemic. And we have to find ways to continue with this. I had a fourth thought, but maybe I will. Uh, we'll okay, okay. okay. The fourth thought was, why does our chancellor trust the artists? Yeah, I mean, uh, you, you talked about mutual trust. Uh, why, why does she trust the artists? And, and this Neustadt program by the Commissioner for Culture is a, is a very, very good program. And the Foreign Ministry did similar programs for the institution abroad, abroad because they trust that artists are crucial for keeping our societies together, put them on a, a track of innovation, of experiment, of of, 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 of cohesion, of a uh, cohesion of society. And this does not reflect only si the situation in Germany, but the whole of Europe. This is true for the whole of Europe. And, and I think this trust in the, in the cultural sector was, was outspoken by the chancellor. And this was very important, I think. So I had many thoughts on your intervention, maybe very not very what you intended to do, but thank you very much. Oh, it's lots of input. We'll be bouncing back and forth, I'm sure. I'd love to come back to Barbara, though, because Barbara actually did already mention Ipertunus in her talk earlier this evening. And I want to just dig a little deeper on the importance of mobility. Barbara, is that still a big um, priority at the moment, that we, that we support mobility even in times of COVID? Uh, yes, uh, uh, also hello again from my side uh, and hello to my co-panelists. Um, indeed, uh, uh, Johannes Ebert just mentioned Iportunis again. This was actually something that was also demand-driven and we've seen it over the past years uh, as, uh, as, a, as a request towards the Commission to set up uh, such a scheme and we used uh, the opportunity of a rising budget towards the end of, uh, uh, of this 
program period to introduce this pilot scheme. And uh, I'm sure you agree with me, Johannes, that it's it's a roaring success, and we can see the necessity to continue uh, to continue that scheme, which is why it will be part also of the new program. I would like to add my two cents uh, on this. First of all. Uh, yes, your question about mobility uh, is absolutely relevant. However, I think mobility alone is not what we can fund. You know, people do travel all over Europe. The, these generations travel via EasyJet, uh, uh, Ryanair, etc., etc. So it's not the mobility per se. We have to make sure uh, that there's also uh, not a result, not not output oriented mobility, but there's some kind of creative and artistic thinking behind uh, behind the way people move across borders. That's the second element. Uh, we are talking about mobility across borders in Europe with a, a perfect aim, which is getting to know each other. Uh, but more than that, you know, not just uh, Auberge Espagnole, as nice as it is, but also with creative ideas on which you want to exchange and then actually also take something back. You will never go back after uh, also a European cooperation project the way you came in. I'm sure uh, Madeleine will, will, uh, will confirm this. You will, you will come out a different person from this exchange. So mobility, absolutely. This is why also uh, we have added this complement on the performing arts sector with the circulation of works, which is equally important. Uh, not only one person travel or two people or a, little, a small group traveling, uh, but also the works uh, and the common, the, the, the joint adventure on which they are going. And this, the last element is that I think in this crisis, um, we have had the feedback a lot that there's a crisis and there has been a, ref a reflex to close borders. There has been a reflex also, uh, just uh, understandably, I would say, to say, okay, maybe support should go to my artists first. I should help those that are in immediate need that I can see uh, in my city, in my region, in my country. And that explains again why it's so important that we support cross-border mobility because we in Creative Europe in particular are the only ones that can give this kind of support, which is not, it's not the support that the Hamburger Hochschule can give, unfortunately, mm -hmm. uh, but it's the support to cross borders and look beyond borders because we believe in the in enriching power of this exchange. I mean, we had uh, with the, you know, when we just got the funding for uh, Dance on Pass on Dream on, it came, you know, we were starting in the in the middle of the crisis and uh, it was crucial for the partners. I mean, we have them from all over uh, Europe uh, and, and to be able, I mean, because, I mean, you know very well, it's very different the situation of the national support in, in the crisis. Some have nothing. I mean, when we have the Zoom conference, there is the one from Sweden that, yes, I got support for, for me for three months and, and, um, and the one from Ljubljana, nothing. They, even the whole funding was cut. And so the European money is, uh, and also with the flexibility, which I know we were informed very uh, early on, uh, how, how, you know, how to deal with it. Um, and that's also something which I learned, uh, and I think it's both on the national and the European level, uh, is to be flexible with um, the rules you have or have from the past, because we really had to change things like that you, we can pay for not working for someone when you know when the contract was still there but they couldn't work and the rehearsals are let's say half a year later but the artist has no money in the moment so how to deal with that and, and it was very new that we got a, a national call in saying uh, and also from the regions we have in Germany yes we can pay in a different way for nothing because of course the artist was there to deliver uh, his work and couldn't because of the pandemic and i know it's mm -hmm. in other fields as well so there, there is a different way of looking at the responsibility also from the funding side which is a new role i think which comes to fund it because we are also a, a funder uh, and that's interesting and I, I wonder what we take from that i mean looking ahead uh, to the future 
um, uh, as, an, as a learning field um, for future funding programs also. I mean, what would you think about uh, that also? Uh, but one must, also, Johannes, one, one, must be, one must be clear, uh, the European funding cannot replace the national funding. Mm. Uh, because uh, uh, we have this split uh, that uh, cultural policies and also education is in the main competence of the member states. So what we can do from the European level is this additional European value of exchange, the, uh, uh, the, the, the mobility program the, uh, to give uh, the possibility to go cross-border, uh, to go all over Europe and make uh, also content accessible for people from all over Europe. Uh, that is the, one of the, of, the, of the main tasks we have to, to support diversity, to support uh, the cooperation between different member states, but we cannot replace uh, the support schemes of the member states for their cultural sector. What we did in the pandemic was via the SURE program. That was a program to, to help member states to support those who lost their job or uh, uh, were in financial difficulties uh, because they couldn't work. Uh, the support schemes we had for self-employed, for SMEs, uh, uh, where the sector is uh, uh, organized mainly in SME structure or self-employed structures. Um, and uh, that is what we did, but we did it through the general schemes. And what I missed a little bit in the, in the past was to have uh, directly targeted schemes to the cultural and creative sector, because very often they could not access these support schemes because of the conditions that were laid down partly by the member states or also by the European level uh, when it came, for example, to support money from the, from the investment bank and so on. It was quite difficult for the, for the sector to, end, to enter. And not many member states did it, uh, what Monica Grütters did and the, the German government or the French yeah. did in the, yeah. in, the, in the crisis to support the sector in such a, let's say, really wonderful way. And that led to these big difficulties and differences between the member states um, and the uh, creators and, and, and artists uh, throughout Europe that some uh, could work on and others were not able uh, even to, 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 to earn the money they need for the month to live. Um, and uh, uh, that was the reason also why the parliament in its resolution, you mentioned it already, uh, that uh, the parliament asked for an earmark of at a minimum 2% of the recovery fund, uh, explicitly dedicated to culture and creative sectors. Because uh, what we fear, and I saw it in the figures we saw from the, from the, um, from the colleague this afternoon, uh, from the regional development uh, funds, from, from DG uh, Regi Regio. Um, if you see how much money is spent, how much money was theoretically available and what was dedicated, but what is really spent through all these years. There was a big lack uh, because the accessibility, even you have in the program money for cultural uh, uh, program projects or for, for the cultural and creative industries of the sector. Um, the accessibility, especially for artists, small artists, and you mentioned it also in, in, in your uh, introduction um, to Artists are not those who are filling in forms in a thousand ways. Uh, uh, they, they want to be creative. They don't want to fill in forms uh, uh, all the time. Uh, and that is, uh, for, uh, uh, for example, also why we always ask as parliament for a higher um, part of, of, of small scale support and, and lump sums uh, for the sector to, to, to make it easier to, uh, uh, to have uh, projects, also sometimes small scale projects because it doesn't work always with five, six, seven or eight. Uh, and also the small exchanges are often very important for better understanding and also creative and new ideas. Something that ties beautifully into that as well that maybe Barbara can also comment on. I've got a question here on Slido that says, how can projects be funded without quantifying their impact? It's very difficult for cultural and creative projects to do so. What do you say to that? It's a question that is recurring, obviously. Uh, we have, uh, Sabine Fahayan mentioned it, we have to, uh, of course, show to the European taxpayer that we are spending the money that he, she give to us uh, in a meaningful way, which is why we are working obviously with indicators and trying to evaluate also 
the projects. Uh, and it's never an easy position in which I'm in which I am when I'm asked this question. But unfortunately, we have to also be able to say, in particular, when it comes to budget negotiations uh, uh, every every seven years, uh, what we actually achieved with the money that uh, was uh, at our disposal. And when I say our disposal, I mean the institutions in favor of the sector. So you can't just completely eliminate quantitative uh, 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 elements of a reply. However, um, nowhere uh, do we really say, you know, how many people came to your event and how many people have you reached, etc., uh, etc. Et if a project is formulated in a way that it, uh, that it shows that the success lies in the inherent structure uh, of working together, then that's also a success. We, it's, it's, it's really this is uh, this is a little bit of a fairy tale, and unfortunately, or a, a prejudice that we're always looking at numbers. A little bit we have to look at numbers, but it's not what makes a good proposal, uh, and it's not what uh, decides on a positive outcome uh, of of an application. Um, we are looking very much into the stories that are behind the projects. We are looking for 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 the narratives behind uh, behind uh, um, successful projects because by explaining to those that eventually decide, uh, uh, then you know they, this this will prove that there's an added value. Uh, with with the support we give, and it's not it's not only about figures, but you know, I mean, I I definitely am the first person to to agree to cutting red tape uh, because I also don't enjoy it. Uh, but uh, we have of course uh, we have of course a financial regulation that we have to adhere to, uh, uh, and I'm sometimes afraid that uh, uh, that this that this uh, control mentality is taking over more and more, the scarcer the money actually becomes, the more you have to fight. We, we were very happy when we, when we could table an individual Creative Europe program and not, it's a small program, but it stands on its own. And if you look around the other programs, they're much bigger, okay. And, but we are there, we are, we are small, but we're fairly beautiful. Uh, and that was already an achievement that that we managed to say uh, at the institutional level with the parliament and the council. Okay, we we fight for our own creative Euro program, for example. Uh, that's already a big step of recognition, I think, uh, of the of the of the importance uh, of the sector. Uh, and we're we're indeed looking very much into possibilities of uh, introducing work packages and lump sums, etc. But we have to bear in mind that we are talking about the whole of Europe and not uh, the project that is close uh, to, to a, a culture uh, senator or a mayor for cultural affairs in, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a Greek city or in a German city. So as Sabine Fahayan rightly said, there are different levels of intervention uh, and uh, surely we have, uh, we, have, we have always work to do and we strive to do better. I think uh, the, this question is as old as culture is. How do you measure the impact of culture? And, and as Barbara said, you have to be very careful to find the right, um, the right intensity of measuring it. Because I think culture sometimes work, works in a way that, that you cannot measure. That's, that's, uh, that's something culture is standing for. It's sometimes experimental. It's sometimes um, unforeseeable. What's happening? But we also, as an institution, of course, are, have to have to have to show how which impact we create. But uh, I think, therefore, it's very important that that organiz organizations like all ours and I take again the the, the, the Ipartunus projects. Uh, do the evaluation on an, on, on an interview basis and not only on a number basis and create a free space for the artists to travel and make it as easy for them uh, as, as possible to, 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 to get their experiences and then collect these and, and, and report back to, to Creative Europe. I think uh, this is the, 
in these kind of projects, the task of the intermediary organizations to make it as easy as possible for the single artist. And I, 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 I tell you that the, that the funding for, for uh, iPortunis is between two and 4,000 euro. It's not very much, but it has a great effect. And then it's our task to collect the, 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 the measurements and the, the, the measurements for the impact and so on. And the second thing is, uh, I want to come back again to the to the trust aspect. Yeah, we cannot measure everything, and we don't want to measure everything in culture. But there has to be a certain trust and a certain experience that every citizen who is ha having contact with culture, who is in culture, is having throughout the European Union that culture is working for bringing people together, for uh, getting innovative ideas, for for. Uh, for, for a cross-border cooperation and that culture is very important for that. And I remember, uh, uh, Mrs. Verheyen, we had, a, we had a discussion with Christian Ehler some, some, uh, some month ago at the opening of another interesting project that was mentioned, Creatives Unite, which is also a Creative Europe project. He said, the cultural sector has to be more self-confident. We should not mm -hmm. be the people who ask for something, but we should say we have to offer something to Europe. And Barbara mentioned it, there's two, 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 two parts of it. That's the economic part, that's, but that's also the value and cohesion part that culture offers. And, and this was a very impressive statement uh, by Christian Ehler that, that we as, culture, as, as people coming from culture have to contrib contribute something very important for the European Union and I think this importance has grown with COVID-19 because as you, as I think also Barbara said it, we all experienced that COVID-19 was uh, strengthened in the national reflex. Yeah, the, the health systems are national, the, 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 everything is nationally organized. And um, now it's our task and uh, the task of people who work like Madeleine uh, in, a, in, in European consortia or that you also do it to, to, to make Europe work. And I think we can be in the cultural and creative sector quite confident that we have some keys to make Europe work and that we should stress. You, you said, to my opinion, something very important and that's also part of the question that is on the second uh, 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 second on the on the list I see on my screen, uh, where uh, is the uh, the question? What uh, what what is your message? What is the message? Yeah. yeah, and the word is wrong. You should not wait for something or wait heavily for something. We still have to fight for something when it comes about the budget for Creative Europe. We have something to offer that was said quite clear, and if if we if we if we want to be enabled to do that. To, 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 to fulfill what we can do, to, to uh, work uh, for uh, the European cultural scene, to work, but not just for the cultural scene, but also for our societies, for the values and for the economical outcome. Uh, we talked already about 4.2% of the GDP comes out of the cultural and creative sectors. Uh, and uh, we don't have to ask for something, please give me. We have to fight for our rights. The automotive sector is fighting to get the support. The uh, uh, airplane sector is fighting to get the support out of the crisis. And the cultural sector has also to fight for that because that's our right to get something, to get the support for what we deliver to our societies, to our economies. And that is what I'm missing at the moment, uh, uh, that, that we, we really have to stand up and to make clear to all these ministers of finance and these ministers of economy that we have to offer something out of the culture and creative sector. And, and we, are, we, we should not be as quiet as we are and we should be united. And that is also something that's not enough at stake at the moment. Uh, every sector is fighting for its own support scheme and, and how can we help in this or that or that situation? No, we have to stand together because otherwise the whole culture and creative sector will be skipped out of these programs, out of these support schemes. Because if you ask uh, the countries uh, that will, that the, the member states that want to distribute the money out of these 750 billion fund, you have to, to, to imagine how much money that would be if we would get 2% of that for the cultural and creative sectors. 
it's much more money than we ever get on European level for culture and creativity. So um, what, what, if, if we really believe that if we sit there and wait for an outcome, uh, I don't think that member states will give us the support uh, we, we, we earn. Uh, and I don't say uh, that we need, but we really, we really earn because we do something. Uh, the, the sector helped to overcome the crisis for many individuals. Uh, the sector was, uh, was, was promoting us and, and delivering content. We could read, we could listen to music. We had online uh, uh, um, uh, theater and, and many, many things that were done uh, to help people to overcome the crisis as human beings and persons. And that was a, a, a huge uh, uh, task the cultural sector took over. And I think uh, they have the right to get the support now to overcome the crisis and come back in an innovative and better way than before. I mean, we had in, in, in Germany on the Tagesschau, so it wasn't just uh, Merkel talking to the artist, but the Tagesschau showing, for example, a violinist in the living room and explaining how the, 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 the support money for um, individual persons wouldn't reach her because she's rehearsing at her home, so there's no spending rather than just working. And so it was quite exceptional that on the national television, you had an artist talking <laughs> to the, the rest of the country. Um, I want to add something to uh, Sabine. Uh, I think, uh, you, of course, you're right. Uh, there is no way around fighting uh, and, and has to be strong. And I was quite impressed. I thought you had probably uh, across all the parties, right, a strong commitment in, in, in speaking for the culture because you have to get the parties together, um, the political parties. I mean, uh, if it's just one, it doesn't help. Um, uh, and uh, but also what I learned in, in, in Germany from the way, because I mean, one billion to spend very quickly, it has to be spent in the next, uh, let's say six, seven months, uh, the German support. So what um, uh, um, the, uh, our, well, basically Grütters did was that they worked together with all the cultural uh, organizations who are very close with their sector. So, uh, and they would uh, develop the schemes how to best bring the money directly where it is needed and also to invent the, the, the funding schemes, be it for individual artists or for structural money. And that was highly exceptional. This was done within two months. You had, uh, it was around 25 different arts organizations from big lobby organizations. I mean, I have an organization of 11 employees, so it's a very small organization to come up and invent funding schemes, invent and uh, basically just be of use for the art scene. And this, I wonder, uh, could this be also a way of thinking uh, about, uh, because I know, I mean, uh, Barbara, you were saying before, you know, we have to be, uh, you know, uh, our credibility is, I mean, it, it's uh, not so easy to bring that big amount of money, uh, spend it and uh, not be accountable for it. Yes, I totally agree with that. Uh, but also, would there be, you know, more diverse way of uh, um, bringing the money where it's needed. I mean, this is what we have been learning right now in the pandemic, it, uh, at least in Germany. I think it's probably exceptional. So could there be a way of opening different channels um, so that it gets faster, more direct, but also, um, of course, I mean, I'm not speaking out of control, that's for sure, uh, uh, towards it. So opening up um, the system of, um, Right now, I speak about European funding. Was can it clear I, what I, I said? <laughs> yeah. uh, whom did you ask? Well, I had asked um, uh, Sabine and Barbara. Okay. But, uh, Johannes wanted to answer. <laughs> no, no, okay, no, no. I, 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 I wanted to add something because I, I, I just want to, to add one thing <laughs> because. Um, Together with the foreign ministry, uh, uh, the Goethe Institute and some German foundations created a program for outside of Europe, because we should mm. never forget outside of mm. Europe, mm. a rescue fund. Yeah, mm. and, and uh, I just want to add that a rescue fund for civil society organizations which are working in culture and education. Because we saw that in, in, in countries all over the world, in South America, in, in North Africa, um, our partners in culture and education were having really big troubles 
because they didn't have any funding from their government. Sometimes you even had the impressions that the governments mm, did not dislike the idea that these, mm -hmm. these civil society organizations uh, get under pressure. So we created a very small fund, it's 3 million euro, but we, 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 we had a big, a big process of spreading the money in, in all these countries with different regional juries. And we all did this in three months. My colleagues were really uh, totally tired and, and I was admiring them very much. But we, we helped uh, tw uh, 140 organizations uh, with about 20,000, 25,000 euros to do, to do projects to react to the COVID crisis. And by this also helping them to continue existing. And I was always dreaming of this being in a European project. Yeah. So just to add to, to what Madeleine said, can we spread these ideas of, of uh, supporting uh, countries in, in, in their structures? I, I mean, Sabine Fahein said it's difficult because we cannot do the, the, the national thing, but, but I, I think it would be a good, good thing to, 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 to work on this. That, that's the reason why we asked for that earmark for the cultural sector and, and, and why the parliament is asking also for having a say how and where the money can be spent out of this recovery fund. At the moment, uh, it looks like this, that the member states uh, will get a support uh, out of this fund and they decide themselves, uh, similar to the operational programs out of the ERDF, uh, where the money is spent and where they set their priorities. There are some priorities set out in the, in the drafts for, for this fund. Uh, uh, culture is one of the points that can be supported, but it's not forced that the member states do it. And I think that is the first step if we want to have uh, uh, a better situation for artists and, and crea uh, creative uh, uh, people throughout all of Europe, we need uh, a dedicated uh, budget for this sector because then we can be sure that member states will spend money. And if we have that, then we can discuss how that money is best distributed in the member states. We don't have in all the member states the same structures like we have in Germany or in France where we have strong organizations smaller and bigger ones, but, but with a stronger background to support artists. We have some, some countries where at the moment we have Article 7 procedures, uh, which don't like the free artistical scene, which try to make everything um, public or state oriented. Um, uh, do you really think that if they can decide themselves how to support the, uh, the creative sector, that it will really be really reach out to, to, to small and medium sized uh, uh, artistical structures, uh, artist structures uh, or free artists uh, that might be a little bit critical to, to the government. Uh, that are the questions we have to raise. And, and that is the reason why we ask for a clear mandate for the cultural and creative sectors. And also the parliament is asking uh, for um, having also a say or a kind of control uh, and if it's just the budgetary control where we where we can uh, take a deeper look in how the money money is spent and if it really uh, uh, reaches out to those who have uh, um, the special needs for this support and, and that is why we why we are asking for that there are lots of other... sorry please do jump in no, no, I just wanted to compliment. Uh, everything is uh, is right, obviously, that uh, Johannes Ebert and Sabine Verheyen said. Uh, and Madeleine, you're, you're absolutely right. We have to constantly rethink also the support mechanisms that we have at our hand. But uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm always unfortunate enough to have to play the devil's advocate there again. Uh, to say that we are not, uh, uh, we are not, we, we cannot reproduce and substitute ourselves to other, to other governmental levels, uh, and we always have to pass the so-called European added value test. So there will always be a European dimension to everything we do, uh, and uh, I invite you to look at our latest monitoring report on Creative Europe uh, that's online, the 2019 uh, report, 
uh, you will see how many hundreds of organizations we have actually supported. And if I say organizations, it's also the people working in these organizations. And it's not, it's the artists, yes, but it's also the creative professionals that are linked to the organization. So we are not funding, you know, the big names or the big structures, etc. But we are, we are kind of looking Uh, and this, for me, is a, is, a, is a sign of solidarity. Where what Sabine also just said, and 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 Johannes, you also mentioned it towards the third countries, towards outside Europe countries. This is a question of solidarity, where those that have more money uh, can also jump in and help those in a partnership approach, in a networking approach. Those that have less money at their availability, and I think this is where our added value comes from. Uh, and uh, this is where we, that this is where we make sense as Europeans, mm -hmm. uh, and not trying to do what others really can do better. Uh, and you know, uh, Creative Europe is more than forty countries today. Uh, it's it's beyond the European Union. How can I how can I make sure that there's equal accessibility? Uh, it is by launching calls for proposals, by, have, by having certain transparent and objective uh, criteria to, and all of, all of everybody has to uh, uh, apply those criteria. And then we can make a hopefully objective decision on who should get funding. But in all the evaluations that we make, we look at the sector in a country. Does it make sense? And I'm coming back to the questions that we had earlier. You know, is something new in a specific context, in a specific sector, innovation, not the bad innovation, but the good innovation? Does it make sense to do a specific approach in a certain country, in a certain sector? And this will also be valued very highly uh, by, uh, by our evaluation. So uh, we're trying really to do justice to the context in which the project proposals come in. But uh, I think we have to, um, next to Iportunis, uh, where, where we, we work with the, with the good, uh, with an intermediary that is closer to the ground already uh, um, for, for the obvious reasons. Uh, but this is uh, what we what we have to what we have to look at more more closely that we will never be the ones that will give the aid just like that because it also opens doors to intransparent decisions and a loss of equal opportunities. I think uh, just one thing, Barbara. Thank you for getting us back a little bit here yeah, because because you start to 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 be very ambitious. What could be done too? Because I think it's very important. Um, I, ju I just read a, uh, wrote in an article that the European Union and, and Europe is a constant process of uh, training to be European. Yeah, and you do this by working in consortia and, and Ipotunis is not done by the Goethe Institute alone, but together with the French Institute and the U mm -hmm. Ukrainian organization Isolatia. In the first round, it was also Lithuanian organization in there. And, and by, by making us or, or motivating us to work in consortia, and I think Madeleine has the same uh, experience, uh, mm -hmm. in European consortia, we get more and more European. And uh, this is an effect which is sometimes not seen uh, by, by politicians. So I think that you, that Creative Europe and other programs make us work together with European partners also already, already has a very big effect on cultural institutions. It's a, a little bit another topic, but, uh, but I wanted to mention that because uh, I think this is very important for... for for the future. Please, um, and can Please I don't say, underestimate politicians. We no, know I, that we I would never, I would never underestimate. <laughs> we are just in the budgeting for Germany, so I would never uh, <laughs> underestimate politicians. I, and I know <laughs> how much you are fighting for these topics, yes, which indeed, we are very indeed. grateful here for. No, and, yes. and I have to say, it wasn't for um, 
you know, saying that uh, Creative Europe should change, actually. I, I loved it from the very beginning with all its names. And it was a very much, much smaller organization when, when I did my first 30 years ago. And it was amazing that I would be seen on the European level when I got the yes. Uh, and um, also, I always had the experience, I mean, that, um, you know, you speak of evaluation when we sent in a, a proposal that there was a proper look at it. I mean, on a national or local level, everybody knows each other and you know the people on the jury. They like me, they don't like me. <laughs> In the beginning, you could still know the jury members of the European uh, funding, but then no longer, <laughs> no way. And the CD has, uh, desk doesn't say it. And I feel very comfortable, actually. It's a good feeling. And also you do something, I mean, this is a little, um, you know, let's say, spelling out all the compliments I have in my pockets uh, uh, for, for the European funding. That is um, actually when you get an evaluation, when you send it in and, and, and align what was good uh, and, and where you could uh, develop, this is something no national funding does. It's the secrecy, it's very intransparent. So there is something which I value very high and it, it comes with a cost because of a, a quite complex system. Uh, and it wasn't so much that I meant the, you, you should change, <laughs> Barbara, you mean, meaning the Creative Europe program. I mean, you are beautiful. <laughs> so, but um, maybe to, to Sabine in the way when you say, well, can one make demands uh, on when this, uh, the big money is uh, uh, brought to the, the partners on, on a percentage of cultural funding or on ways how it should be given to. And this could, you know, if, if, if there is a way to make political pressure, uh, like on some rules, that it's just, you know, not totally free, you get the money, but it comes with an obligation. Normally, every money comes with an obligation. So uh, I know you're fighting for that. Uh, and I, I support you in your good fight. Brilliant. And on that note, I have to say we have the time has flown. I want to thank all of you for such a wonderful conversation that felt like we were sitting around a dinner table together. Thank you for making my job completely superfluous. I didn't even need to be here. Um, that was a wonderful conversation. I wish we had more time together, but that is it, I'm afraid. I'm sure there's lots of there's 170 people who are still with us who are probably yeah. quite hungry right Dude. now and want to get to dinner. Um, so a huge true. thank you. <laughs> exactly. A huge thank you to you, the panelists, and to all the speakers this evening. It's been a fantastic evening, lots of information. I think my head's grown physically since we began. Um, at this point, I'd also like to ask you, lovely panelists, just to, to bow, give us a curtsy, and turn off your cameras, because I'd like to ask the Creative Europe Desk Culture team to come forward so we can thank them for putting this wonderful event together for us today. Are we back? Good. We'll keep, we, we can clap. The rest of the audience ah, can't okay. clap because we can't hear them, but there they are. That's the wonderful team. <laughs> oh, come on, let's clap louder. Fabulous. Thank you so much for all your hard work. I know this took a while to pull together and we didn't know whether it would be virtual or online or offline or what, but we, we made it. It was a great time. Thank you to everyone who was involved. Give yourselves a pat on the back. Thank and you very much for this wonderful uh, Thank uh, you. chat. It was really good for us. Thank great? all the, the, the whole audience that they stayed here uh, with us discussing. Thanks a lot. Thank you to everyone. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Thank you to everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye. bye, -bye.